Professor James Wilkinson, Assist Associate Dean, University of Southampton. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the University of Southampton and also to the Faculty of Physical Sciences and Engineering. Unfortunately, you can't have the real dean. Uh, he wasn't able to be here. But uh, um, our faculty uh, is, uh, has worked in the center of the internet and uh, the web for many years. From the technology of optical fiber, which underpins the internet, to the activities at the interface between technology and society uh, represented by the Web Science Institute. Um, I am quite a long way away from this research area, uh, and, but I can see that the, the future of text um, is clearly something which is uh, going to be important for our communication to, with our future generations, including some of our younger attendees uh, uh, in the future, uh, as uh, Ben Surf has noted in uh, some of his comments. Um, it's also, for me as an academic, uh, clear that uh, the vast volumes of text which come my way every day need to be managed much better. As commented in the uh, materials which went out with this symposium. Um, and if you can make uh, a, a great contribution to improving my life in that way, I'd be very grateful. Um, it's, looking at the programme, it, it seems to me a very stimulating format and uh, a very impressive range of uh, eminent speakers you have over the next uh, couple of days. Um, I, I very much hope that you both enjoy your two days and uh, find them productive. I noticed up here we had a future of text before my name popped up. On the door you've got the future of text. <laughs> uh, and I hope that maybe over the next two days when you leave, you've got slightly closer to the future of text. Um, so, as I said, I hope you enjoy your two days. I. Uh, very much welcome you to the university and uh, of course it's nice to see so many familiar faces here uh, and also some new faces as well and I hope that we can continue our work together uh, over many years. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so the formalities uh, I don't know, you've probably all figured it out already. Food will be served one room over that way. Bathrooms are also down that corridor. If there is a fire, we should probably leave. <laughs> and there, if you take a left, there's a parking lot. That's where we should be congregating. And uh, where's Nicola? She's not in the room. No, no, I'm just wondering if I missed out any formalities. So the way we'll be running this is the same as all the other Future of Text Symposium. 10 minute presentation and then five minute dialogue and we will be cutting off on the second. So in the middle of your presentation after five minutes, if you can all look at the back of the room. Nobody can see that, you have to come closer. <laughs> it, uh, unless my son Edgar has some urgent business, uh, <laughs> there will be some waving in the back and also a one minute warning. but. I will be on the side here all the time, and I will be in your face <laughs> to cut you off on the exact moment. It just makes it a lot less um, stressful if we finish exactly on time. Um, please check the website for the running order so you know when you're up next, uh, those of you who are speaking. Um, some of you have given me presentations. If you haven't, uh, you can give me a URL, USB, SD, whatever you prefer. Because the way we'll do it is when one person is doing the Q&A <coughs> over here, the next person will be getting ready with our presentation. Any questions about how we're running the day? Excellent. Tomorrow is a collaborative design day. And uh, it will be an unconference. And we've, decide, you know, we've had lots of discussions on how to run it. But we decided to make it as simple as possible. In the morning, it will be what are the issues we need to deal with discussion with uh, a Google Doc, you know, collaborative writing space. 
in the afternoon, what do we need to do to get there? That will be held in the room behind where the food is today. So if you have an opportunity to join us tomorrow, that will be very good. So I'm Fred Hagland. I am uh, one of Wendy's, where, where are you Wendy? There she is. I'm one of Wendy's students probably, hopefully by the end of the day as well. <laughs> uh, been, uh, let's not talk about last night. So this is the seventh annual Future of Text. And you may wonder why in the world would I keep doing this? Uh, we've had them in London, Silicon Valley and Southampton. So what I'm going to do for a few minutes is um, basically preach a little bit to the choir, considering who you guys are. So as a species, we are facing serious issues. Not that I need to remind you, climate change and what I call lack of global social cohesion, meaning social inequalities, wars, all of that stuff. These are serious issues. And I really don't think that going back to only pre-literate media is going to solve these problems. I mean, AR is going to be great, VR is going to be exciting, but seriously, all of these visual medium, it's just like walking around in a room to an extent, isn't it? So that's <laughs> incredibly naive. I would say that text is the most powerful communication and thought augmentation technology our species has invented. We have to remember that it's not just communication, it's also thinking that happens with text. And we're still inventing. We're inventing both through passive cultural shifts, which is basically what sells, but we can also take charge and do a more active development to really try to serve academic and intellectual and other actual real needs. Don't forget, most software has to be sold within the first minute of playing with it, if it's going to try to be something new. So let's keep in mind what text is. Of course, there will be many of you in here who would want to argue these points, but what I'm trying to say is that text is what we want it to be, okay? Let's not forget that. Uh, you could joke and say that it is not written what text is. It really isn't. Beyond the basic symbols on a screen, it's up to us. The future of text, in one way, it's kind of obvious. <coughs> History. And there are many in the room here who have done amazing work in the past. Many others have done amazing work in the past that isn't in the wider world. So, yes, we need to learn from history. We need to have new ideas, do the testing and all of that. And let's not forget, we have powerful machines now. We, you know, even an Apple Watch is more powerful than what was used a few decades ago to develop things. So dreams can happen. But the real reason to put up this bit obvious slide is this. If we don't have collaboration between users, industry, government, and developers, and more, on requirements, design, building, testing, and infrastructure, it's not going to be an active development, is it? And that is why you're here today. It is to get to meet each other, to have a chat. Because it is crazy. We're living in the most networked age humanity's ever seen. And yet, even people in the same industry, we haven't met before, many of us. So, so this is the slide that I really want to sink in. And this is why I would request that all of you really try to pretend you're all in industry, you're all running a startup, and you're here to network. Say hi to everybody. A brief moment on perspective, because once you're older than, what, 10, 15 years old, you think the world is kind of what it is, right? Of course, that's rubbish. 200 years ago, we appear as we are today, at least with all the physical stuff, right? And then we invent alphabetic writing 5,300 years ago or so. Where and how, those details doesn't really matter. That's a very interesting symposium by itself. 500 years ago, we have printing and then 49 years ago, computer text. I say 49 years ago, not because that was the year I was born, but because that was the year of, oh yeah, I'm on a podium, come on. That was the year of? The hmm? mother of all demos. That's right, the mother of all demos. So we can kind of put that in the history books as, wow, that was a big thing. And textual innovation since then? <laughs> 
Right? It's a bit embarrassing. So that, that's history till now. But you know, if you go on a, on a longer time scale, you see, so four and a half billion years, a little more, we got our planet, then we have life. Humans appear almost typographically at the now point. So we've been around for a while, but what makes my skin tingle is the next slide. We're in the middle of the life cycle of this planet, based on the life cycle of our sun, right? We have another four to five billion years on this planet. So I don't want to hear any bullshit about legacy, about how things can't change, right? Because this is the very, very, very first inkling of days of digital text, which is very hard. You know, I'm trying to do a PhD under Wendy and uh, you know, when we are such early days, so I just need to keep checking my timing here so I don't go against what I said earlier. <laughs> most of what's been done is just feeble attempts, right? There's some genius work, but most of it's feeble. Let, let's, get, let's get somewhere. So there is a future. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Edgar. Uh, don't worry, he's on a slide later today. So for those of us who believe in the power of text, we have a weighty responsibility, but we also have an amazing opportunity. Let's remember also that the written word is an act of persuasion. No sentence has ever been written that is not trying to persuade you of something, trying to sell you something. Even the most bland sentence is at least saying, I exist, I am useful, I am meaningful, and I'm true. So, taking that into account, sell, okay? We've had many of these future texts, they've been good, but today I'm especially asking you, if you have something to sell, sell it. Whether it's an idea, work, a company, a project, an organization, don't be humble and mumble at the end, okay? Just scream and be loud. So, let's embrace the future of text together. Thank you very much. Yes. So, uh, what did you do with slides? I can't remember. Um, I'm on the desktop uh, future text. My name is Les Carr. Uh, very hang pleased. on, hang on. You have a second. Yeah. Have a second. Let's, let's, no let's cheating. Oh, now to start before the stopwatch starts. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, I just. Honestly, give a PhD student some authority. I have two minutes, you know. There you are. Oh, here we go. And I'm going to. Which one was it? That's yours. Uh, it was a, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint um, for LAC. I, I've, I've got one. the wrong. I've got the glasses on to see oh, the people, okay. not the text. Oh, right, all right. Ironically, <laughs> you still have a few seconds. So it's fine. This one, right? That's right. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, uh, so that that the title that I've given myself seems to be particularly. Uh, relevant uh, at uh, 12 o'clock last night. Now it looks just a little pretentious, and I apologise. Um, but what what I want to uh, um, I kind of want to dovetail with uh, what uh, Freud has been saying, um, despite the fact that, that that timeline of the five billion years either way and now actually looks like when I'll be able to retire with a state pension. Um, it's uh, you know, the, the, the really, the text uh, has always been to me um, the key importance. Uh, and that's what I learned at the university here. We are, at the moment, we are hacking each other's minds 140 characters at a time. And that's, you know, it's never been more important for us to learn how to communicate more effectively. Um, I'd just like to start, I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to emulate Ted Nelson too much with his, you know, sort of my past is your future, but you you are kind of literally sitting on my past and Dave DeRaw's past because this is where we started out. So the 101 to 135 University Road, it used to be a series of Victorian se um, semis uh, where the computer science group started. And, and absolutely. Uh, when uh, so my office was under the stairs at the back 
uh, when, I, when I first joined. We had a text lab, which was at the back of the building on the top. We, oh, wow, we've got the new laser writers, fonts, you know, sort of postscript. This is incredible. Uh, Wendy, Dr. Hall at the time, was very much at the front and on the top, uh, as it turned out, uh, and has never moved from that position, getting further to the front. <laughs> Further up, obviously. We had this, uh, the text lab, oh, that was a great time uh, installing the first versions on tech on machines that could barely um, cope with it and installing and compiling it. We're, you know, we've then moved into a web world of HTML. I'm actually really proud of HTML. I think it's, I think it's amazing compared to the alternatives. I will, I know that Donald Knuth is uh, a genius and that he did a fantastic thing for the world in, in inventing tech and metafont and enabling scientists to communicate but really a text processing language in a macro processing environment he should be struck off from you know sort of computer science for, for, for doing that I've never been able to reconcile myself to that and the problem used to be can we can our technologies keep up with the way that we create text and now it just feels like you know sort of there is a there is a reverse problem. Um, oh, that's the wrong computer. I'm pressing the wrong buttons. So I'd like to say, you know, sort of my, I started in text. I wanted to do a PhD in artificial intelligence, you know, uh, before it was fashionable. And, um, and David Barron, uh, who had taught me a module on indexing, in, you know, how to write indexing programs in, in Unix, you know, and how to process text, told me, don't study artificial intelligence, because if you want to understand the human mind, look at the documents that, that people produce. That will tell you everything that you need to know about human intelligence. And, uh, and so I followed, I followed his advice, and I got into hypertext. And the, you know, he, he said a number, he, he also said, um, research is just the, uh, the accidental output of researchers trying to get promoted. And um, I, thought that was, I thought both of these things were ridiculous at the time. They turned out to be really true. Um, we, we have, in many ways, reached the future as far as I We've got high real-time, high-fidelity rendition of text, instantaneous global dissemination, interaction, collaboration, automatic generation of text, fantastic ways of analysis and understanding. And in many ways... It's what we do with that that's so broken. So in our own sphere, in academic publishing, we have this knowledge, we can create it, we have these systems for doing it, and then we completely bugger ourselves up, sorry, um, at the, um, in, in how we build systems, how we build the socio-technical on top of that. You know, the, the academic publishing that we get, we pass over... Um, all of our knowledge to, we outsource it, we privatise it to pri private companies, they charge us huge amounts of money and effectively bar us from you know, sort of disseminating that properly. The whole of open access, something that we've been involved in very much at Southampton, has been part of that. Um, uh, <coughs> And publishing itself, you know, this larger issue, you start off with a system, um, you know, sort of Tim Berners-Lee creates this fantastic system where you can, uh, you know, sort of someone can put something on the internet and everyone can read it. It's highly decentralised. Um, it's wonderful. But, and we teach that in, in our modules now on about how to do t HTTP and this client server thing. That's not how the web works anymore. You need to, be, you know, to get to get content disseminated to your audience. You need content delivery networks. You need huge amounts of really expensive infrastructure. And there is a few companies that are dominating that. We're recreating a sort of publishing empires and publishing networks in a very technological way. Um, and it's not clear that we've got it right yet. Um, and it's not clear we've hit the most, you know, by creating an open system in which, you know, a thousand flowers can bloom, it's right that some of them will become, you know, sort of huge, enormous, uh, huge, enormous trees that you'll, ha you'll have a lot of that dominating the landscape. As long as it, they don't become the Japanese knotweed, you know, that, 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 that stops everything else growing. Um, you, you have to realise that the web 
you know, the, the web obviously is not just a piece of technology you install. Um, it's a huge network, an ecology uh, of technologies, companies, and markets, and you make one change somewhere, and it has knock-on changes everywhere else. And in the Web Science Institute here, we, um, we study that, um, and we're particularly interested in how that's working out. The W3C, we're the uh, office for the UK and Ireland, uh, you know, it's promoting its open web platform based on HTML and DOM. We've now merged with the IDPF, EPUB to look at publishing activities rather than individual um, document activities. Um, but I think, <laughs> where do I come into this? I'm more and more struck by the fact that Ted Nelson was, uh, was right. <laughs> that it, the, the W3C kind of position statements that information exists in an abstract space. It just is, you've just got to give it a URI, have a protocol for accessing it and understanding it. This misses off so much. Information is owned. It's the result of human effort. <coughs> Copyright isn't just a corporate evil. It is also a corporate evil when, you know, sort of uh, pursued to a large extent. It's a social contract that establishes fungible value in the text, in the information that we spend our lives creating uh, and allows you know, people to, to, to benefit from that. And if we produce technology systems that ignore that, what happens is you get big corporate, you know, sort of giants coming in and taking the value from it without the reward for the individuals. I think, I think the W3C activities on payment and provenance, ironically, may be the most useful things for the future of text. There. That's me being controversial. Thank you. <laughs> and that's why you're my advisor. Thank you. <laughs> that's right. uh, questions, comments, five minutes. Nigel, you're up next. <laughs> oh, yes. Can you unpack pavements and violence? Oh, okay. Well, so t so when Ted produced his system for Xanadu, uh, which we've you know, um, which many of us have studied for a long time, uh, then you know, at the heart of it was the idea that if you know, transclusion of someone else's material would result in a flow of payment, or acknowledgement, benefit, something back to that person. Yes. And so it had intellectual property absolutely coded into the centre of it. And what I teach my students uh, in a sort of master's level, undergraduate level, is you know, when we, when Tim, sorry, we created, when Tim just, just created the web, he was in an environment which was highly government, which was centred on government patronage, huge amounts of funding, huge amounts of money, and the imperative, the, the research, the academic imperative, is to share information and to move it beyond silos for other people to recognise. It, it's, a, it's a bit of a, an idealistic position of what the academy is, but it's roughly speaking... That's where we are. And so they weren't interested in cybercrime. They weren't worried that people would come in and steal all the large hadrons that they were investigating. And they weren't, and they weren't holding out their own research team's discoveries for the highest bidder from another university. Uh, and <coughs> so that, uh, uh, we didn't put that in. Tim, I don't want to blame him. I'm just saying that the academic view of what communication should be which then blew on to become everyone's view in the web, just didn't care about that at all. And so putting that back in, the issues of payment, secure payments, provenance of... Tra uh, this is work that Luke has been uh, running. Are you going to be talking about that later? You know, tracking how information is treated and processed and who is responsible for different parts of it. I think the, the, these are crucial in us being able to create a valuable cultural uh, building platform. So, uh, Vince, sir, 
Um, let me challenge you at least on one point. Uh, copyright is intended by most laws to be a finite period of time, and I submit to you that the current legal arrangements, at least in the United States, are outrageous. To allow someone to claim copyright for 75 years after the death of the author or something mm -hmm. simply makes no sense to me at all. On top of which, at least in the American formulation, it was only 14 years. Yes. And then it was supposed to be entered into the public domain. And there yes. was a deal if you were still alive after 14 years uh, with a payment you could extend it to another 14. That was it. So what I'm concerned about is attaching this intellectual property notion too firmly to the content and not being able to undo it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a terrible outcome because uh, access in the public domain is super important. So I'd be interested to know how you would respond to that. Mm -hmm. Well, public domain uh, means that something is entirely free from copyright. Copyright says that the author, that the, author the content creator, is, has, has control over it and it is allowed to gift it to people, allow them to use it, is allowed to put restrictions on it. They have all sorts of rights. And so I think because of the abuses of copyright, we've tend, you know, so I speak as an open access advocate, yeah, all right, okay. and I, you know, sort of, I, you know, Elsevier, all of these things, you know, I, I you sign up to, to all of those. I've produced tech, I've produced uh, systems with Chris Scutteridge and, and others to try to make universities, you know, sort of buck that system. What we, ha I'm going to say the word e-prints just to get it on the tape. Um, so uh, what we, uh, uh, and I think, but I think in trying to get away from the abuses, we've ignored the fact that there are some, some good, some good things inherent in copyright, which which says, you know, sort of the, uh, that a creator, an artist, uh, a scientist, a writer, a journalist, or whatever, has invest. Sorry, I said. Word, um, has invested real, uh, a lot of human effort in doing that, and they have, they have some right, rights well, in that. I'm not objecting to copyright, I'm only objecting to its abusive treatment. Oh, absolutely. The law. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. seem like you're anti-copyright, it seems like you're anti-abusive. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that's supposed to be, it, you know, so it's a legal thing. Law is supposed to be about negotiations between multiple parties coming to, a, coming to an agreement within a framework of how, um, how we're going to act. Of course, what happened, you know, you could argue that it's an, actually an abuse of law because, it, you know, because the big expensive corporations have the big expensive lawyers and they, you know, they get, they get to lobby Parliament or Congress. There, there or are no inexpensive lawyers, <laughs> <laughs> at least in my experience. Absolutely, absolutely. No good ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, Char I'm not sure who's chairing. Charlie? Hi, Nancy. Um, so I think maybe that something interesting is you, you mentioned on your last slide that in, information is owned, okay? Um, yeah. And uh, I think that's maybe something that's uh, creating a little bit of friction here. I think mm -hmm. the problem isn't that um, uh, we acknowledge that people have contributed to information, because of course they have. Yeah. But it's this idea of locking information down and holding it and uh, you're owning it that is arguably the problem. And by saying that the future is connected very much to sort of this idea of, sort of problems and payment, that seems to be sort of mimicking uh, an approach to information that we had in mm. times of old, where information very much was owned and withheld. And arguably, the web has actually sort of pushed against that by trying to open information up. Okay. You know, everybody contributes so to the great that, uh, uh, collection of information. And should we be perhaps think, be thinking in terms of uh, crediting and accreditation rather than uh, ownership? Well, I think that's entirely because you've been intellectually abused by the copyright system. So you're, you're, you're equivocating ownership and um, closing down, not being allowed to use. And I think but the, the point of copyright is it allows the... And whatever, whatever part of society they're in, in, in the academic world... Are you, are you out of time? You know, it allows them to make the decision within the context that they operate about what's right for them. So it doesn't necessarily mean that. Should, perhaps we should think of responsibility, because that, you know, data can't be a legal. Out of time. Out of time. Out of time. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Nigel Shadbolt. Hi. Um, so as somebody who started out 
um, in AI when it was very unfashionable in 1978. Uh, what am I doing talking about text? Um, having worked for many years in areas like semantic web technologies and, and trying to struggle with the whole notion of preserving and maintaining access to data, um, something really, really unsettling has been happening to me. And I'm sure to many of you, I'm sure many of you will just recognize the symptoms of what I'm going to describe now. Indeed, Vint has talked passionately about the whole notion of the digital dark age. It, I'm living it. I'm living it to the extent that I think I have lost a very substantial part of my recent history. And here's a little run through that. Um, this is a PDP 11 tape. Um, it's a tape that contained uh, my original thesis. It contained some of my ar email archives and logs. Um, it was lost in a fire. Uh, um, uh, I didn't have enough physical backups. Um, there were, I thought, copies left in Nottingham when I moved to Southampton. They had been destroyed. Uh, it happens. Stuff goes. Um, and we know there are particular challenges around the, the actual persistence of these kinds of media. I'm going to come on to why this relates to text, but we all have this sense of loss. But what's really amazing me is we don't have to go back to deep time to lose this information. Um, in fact, in some respects, we go back a long way and can be extraordinarily impressed by what has survived, as I'll show. I was trying to find the first standalone Unix box that I proudly possessed when I went to Nottingham from Edinburgh in 1983. Eddie Bleasdale uh, built a, a Unix a multiprocessor box, the Bleasdale Sentinel. I can't find a photograph of it. <laughs> I have looked. I have literally looked. I, mean, I spent quite a long time last night looking for it. This is all I could find. This is a piece of writing from 1988 when uh, just survived into the web era. Um, there's a whole bunch of programs on there um, that weren't sufficiently distilled off, taken off. One of the biggest and most injurious pieces of cultural lobotomization happened partly through this process. Now, you'll know that Sun Microsystems has just famously um, ceased to exist in, in, in very real sense. I mean, in the sense that Solaris and other things are being um, uh, given up on by, by, by Oracle. Oh, it's a bad idea. Um, but there's their, there's their, their, there are their tapes. I have a boatload of these in my desk. I have nothing to read them. I have some of the most important research I think I undertook was in a variant of languages, ProtoQ, consisted of SWI Prolog, variants of Lisp that were very dependent on the operating system at the time. This was before VMs. It would be a huge issue to restore a capability to look at those programs and inspect and understand them in the context of the papers that I was writing and promoting and my team was in 1996. Okay. This, is, this is extraordinary. Um, now here's, to contrast that, um, this is an extraordinary uh, set of uh, cuneiform tablets and it was actually <coughs> featured on the front of science uh, last year where uh, a recent translation has discovered that now I'm an Oxford man, I say these sorts of things. In the 14, in the 14th century, the Oxford uh, calculators uh, came up with a method of calculating geometrically all sorts of things, the philosophy time graphs, they used it to predict things like uh, the, the, the rising of Jupiter, to predict where it would be on the belt of the ecliptic. They were doing it, it appears, in Sumeria thousands of years ago. And this method documents a geometric velocity time graph where they worked out how they did it. Isn't it quite extraordinary? The fascinating thing about this knowledge, it was, it would, it was discovered for what it was just a few years ago. The language itself was rediscovered um, thanks to, it had been used, the cuneiform scripts in a variety of interpretations and languages for 3,000 years. It went extinct around about 100 AD, they think. So it survived a long time, but it had been effectively lost. It was then essentially uh, recovered through, um, this is the Rosetta Stone for cuneiform scripts, the Behestun inscription, which is the achievements of Darius the Great in, in three different cuneiform forms with enough historical figures proclaiming their greatness and victories that they could relate it to Herodotus' writings. They could relate it to some forms of language and the whole is 
a Syrian kind of scholarship grew up around over the last couple of hundred years on efforts to decode that and bring that language back. Bringing it back because they chiseled the bloody stuff into quarries, into, into, in, into petrograss, into the rock. It's solid state storage. It's a very... <laughs> There, I mean, it suffered some insults over the years, not least when, um, when, when, when American infantry used it for target practice in the second year. <laughs> uh, and, and a few other people have tried to kind of take chips out of it. But it's, but it's been extraordinary um, um, to see that. Now, back to shallow time. Um, my, this is, last weekend, actually, I'd, my wife and I had, had dinner with Vint a couple of weeks ago at Ditchley. And he'd been proclaiming this issue about the loss, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here it is, iOS 3 on a 3GS iPhone. No longer can you get the data. You can't get your contacts, your photos. iTunes does not support, is not backwards compatible with, what is this? It's a seven-year-old technology. You have to go out there and try and find intermediate software, which are somehow get the most routine material off of this standard device. There has been no provision for it, no thought for it, no serious attention to it, and we all recognise that. And yet, in the process of looking backwards, we're taking more care over lovely things as we should. These are the Royal Society uh, a project I'm involved with, and when, when is involved with uh, the digitisation of their wonderful literatures back to the earliest days. And the use of the very best textual technology to index and cross-index and annotate and bring to life the social network of commentators and peers from <laughs> three and four hundred years ago. But my fear is we're actively erasing our current immediate past memory. And I will leap to the defence of Con Donald Knuth, by the way. Uh, the <laughs> You can make what you will of tech, but let me just tell you that the art of um, computer programming is one place where written down in plain text, I can find the most elegant and brilliant descriptions of algorithms you can imagine. I have one of my prized possessions is a book, a book from the uh, 17th century, which is the art of shadows. It's a book on how to build sundials. It allows you to build and construct today an instrument that can tell the time. We have so little of that capacity to reconstruct. Programs are data, programs are text. How are we going to provide for the future? And I know this is on people's minds, but I do think it needs to be on the minds of all of us, all of the time. Um, they will survive best as open data, which is why I love and admire uh, what, uh, what Knuth has did with his wonderful books. But what substrates will we need? What virtual machines, what formats, what primers and interpreters? Because ultimately, to make sense of much of our collective labor in what we do in programming, how can I now bring to life the experience that I had with my ProtoQ system, the labor of about 200 person years on three EU projects that is lost on tapes that no one will ever read? Thank you. Good timing. Lots of questions. Questions, please. Oh, questions. For <laughs> <laughs> Les, right. yes. So your point about the iPhone is really interesting because it, in in um, the communities that are interested in uh, preservation of digital content, one of the processes that the, you look to is content migration. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, through yeah. successive you know, sort of generations. Translations yeah. between yeah. Yeah. And effectively. That you know that has been happening. You know the content does migrate. It's not like word perfect. You know, it just suddenly stops and then you, know, yeah. you can't do it. Yeah. Um, but you have to do it at such a velocity, yeah. and you have to keep up with those. people aren't doing it. And I don't think I'm unusual. I, I just think I just think that the requirement and the automaticity and the support we're provided means that the much more irreducible and robust versions of what we might want are, are not there. It's the kind of feature creep. From, and there's something around the pace of change being such that we are just not careful, I don't think. And we're not, yeah, you say, if I'd have kept on doing, kept on doing it. But 
we all know that people leave a couple of generations behind and then they simply give up on it. It's just, and you might say, well, it's gone, it's the chatterings, it's who needs all those photographs, all those SMSs, who needs all those things. I just think it's uh, interesting that they offer us the prospect of the next step on, but not the five generations back. Yeah. So, just, I'd like to reinforce that if I could. Uh, the movie industry right now is experiencing exactly this problem. They keep getting higher and higher resolution uh, systems, and their storage uh, mechanisms have had to change. There are some standards for storing movies away, and all the, you know, the, the shots that they use to assemble the movies. But what happens is that the standards keep changing in order to uh, cope with these new ways of storing the information. They maintain backward compatibility for no more than two generations of, uh, of their standards. And so you have to pay in order to recode all that stuff. The movie industry is now spending you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, re, re, uh, holding onto all of the information that they need from movies they've already made, plus the new ones that they're doing. So the problem is, is manifestly real, even when you're doing the migration. I had to laugh when you mentioned word, word perfect. I found some three and, a, three and a half inch floppy disks in a cabinet, and I actually got a three and a half inch floppy disk reader off of eBay or something, plugged it into my laptop, and pulled off some word perfect files. Of course, I couldn't run word perfect on the laptop because there wasn't any operating system available, blah, blah, blah. So you know, we really do have a serious problem. Nigel, that was so passionate, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what we do about it, yeah. So we should look at HTML as, uh, uh, By the way, Henry, uh, just, um, I should have said earlier, can we follow Vincent's example and introduce ourselves, yeah, at least by the first name? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, so Henry Story, I'm also a PhD student. So I just thought it'd be interesting to know, look at, at, at the evolution of HTML. It looks like, I would think that, yes, that HTML uh, has survived. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, I, th I think you want to try and learn what it is in terms of those minimal commitment, perhaps, standards, which, which, which can preserve. And there's a big lesson across a range of our substrates for doing that. I think that's the point. But my, yeah. my guess is that with the JavaScript apps, the, that's where it's going, where it's going the same direction. And you have data in the app that's, that is only readable by the app that's yeah, produced that's, by the board. And that's where we were with our, with our old fangled uh, uh, AI chromium environments. They were very dependent on the underlying OS. They just you don't live anymore. Yeah, John? Yeah, sorry. Hi, so my name's John Sheridan. I'm the digital director of National Archives. So one of my teams is responsible for preservation. Um, now we've only relatively recently started archiving um, government GitHub accounts so that we can start to preserve the code of a digital government. Now we can apply engineering effort to mitigating some of these risks. The hard part is the decision making. How do you turn your finite quantity, which is money, into the best mitigation of a complex risk landscape? How do you make those decisions yeah. and who decides? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not the engineering. We can actually <coughs> can emulate, we can migrate. It's the decision making that we That's need to put our minds sure. to. Who decides and how do we put our finite quantity <coughs> of money into mitigation? Who decides what evidence the future will get? Yeah, sure. So, yeah. I think uh, it's interesting when you're talking about your chiseled stone tablets. Yeah. This is an example of a substrate which has survived. But don't yeah. you think the thing that makes it amazing and the thing that makes it beautiful is that so much media existed, far less than we're creating now, admittedly, but so much media existed for digital. Yes. And is it the thing, is actually the thing that makes yeah. the things we preserve not really the endeavour to preserve, but successfully preserved by accident yeah. so remarkable the fact that they made it this far? <laughs> No, indeed, indeed. I mean, I, 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 let me just express one personal regret. I have to, uh, uh, I can't attend, and you never do this, uh, the rest, much of the more of the day, because I have to go to a funeral of a student. Um, and and, right. and I, was minded to, um, uh, I was minded of this when I thought, well, you know, what does endure? And there is something special. I remember uh, uh, listening to a talk where people said the great orators lamented the arrival of text because they thought it would destroy an enemy. What it doesn't destroy is great human thought. And uh, I will just leave you with this uh, uh, um, uh, piece of thought. This is a piece of Shakespeare, and I would submit to you this will endure in any substrate. 
When he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will fall in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Now that is, is, a, is, is a, that will endure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vint Cerf. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for allowing me to attend. Nigel gave about 95% of what I was going to say, so <laughs> thank you. No, Nigel, it's wonderful because that saves me the trouble. And, and in fact, what this, this might translate into uh, more discussion and less talk. Um, and, oh, but, but, but before you start properly, Stacey Mason, uh, oh, you are here, fantastic. Okay, you're next. Sorry, I wasn't sure if she was here. Oh, I thought that you were telling me I was done. Uh, <laughs> you wish. That was the shortest talk on record. Um, so let's see. First of all, uh, oh, I have to uh, confess I'm unable to join you tomorrow, and I really hate that because it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. But this is actually in the middle of a three-week uh, holiday. Uh, my wife is, uh, has a serious case of Downton Abbey disease. Uh, <laughs> so we tend to come here and visit stately homes and manor houses all over the place, talk about preservation. Uh, so yeah, it's amazing. All right, so uh, I have three points that I want to make. For, uh, this whole uh, issue for me is broken into three parts. There's text generation, there's text consumption, and there's text preservation. And those are three pieces that I think are worthy of our attention. And I wanted to uh, share a little anecdote with you about text generation. Uh, Richard Ovenden, who uh, some of you will know, uh, is responsible for uh, running the Bodleian Library, and I were having breakfast one morning at our house in McLean, Virginia. We decided to start writing a paper on digital preservation together. So we both had our laptops open, opposite each other, um, and we opened a Google Doc. And uh, we, we produced a collaborative outline, and then he began working on one part and I was working on another. And every once in a while, remember now we're sitting across from each other, every once in a while we would call attention to something that, that we were doing and the other person would go look at it and comment and we would argue back and forth and we would try different texts. So we're going back and forth for about three hours doing this joint uh, document. And it dawned on me somewhere along the line that we didn't have to be sitting across the table. We could have been 3,000 miles apart doing exactly the same thing with video conferencing, working on the same document. So this collaborative environment um, is really quite astonishing. I do more and more of my work with other groups in collaborative ways with spreadsheets, for example, to keep track of action items and things like that. I don't think anyone really appreciates the utility of this collaborative environment, this one where we can both be editing the same document at the same time. The people who did this work must be just incredible because not only is everything happening in real time, being distributed to all the parties that happen to be plugged into that document, but it's also being copied multiple times in order to preserve the information on a regular basis. I mean, it's just constantly being updated. So I'm super impressed and even though I work at Google and I know I don't mean for this to sound like a sales pitch for Google, but more a sales pitch for collaborative work. Okay, now, text consumption. Uh, what, um, what Froda has taught us is that interacting with text is elaborated amazingly when we have computers at our beck and call. And Doug Engelbart demonstrated that 49 years ago, but, but Froda continues in that uh, vein. And when you look at some of his tools like Author and the others, there is this world of text which is alive. It's not just marks on paper anymore. And despite all the bad problems we just heard from Nigel, and, and with I, which I agree with, uh, the bad problems we have with computers and text and everything else, it also makes that stuff much more alive and much more potentially meaningful, richer in some sense. And so I'm still a big fan of consuming text in that context. Preservation, well, it's all gone to shit, um, to, uh, to use a, uh, an Anglo-Saxon uh, term. We're going, we're going backwards, basically. The cuneiform tablets last 5,000 years, partly because they weren't intended to, by the way. The problem is the warehouses burned down and baked the tablets and made them into something much more reliable and, and resilient. Vellum can last a couple thousand years, but it costs you a lot of sheep per book to do the vellum. 
But that like, rag paper, eh, 200 years. The CD-ROM, 20, maybe. <coughs> uh, and oh, by the way, that's if you have a reader to read the bits. If you don't have a reader to read the bits, it's all over with. Five and a quarter inch floppies, three and a half disks. You know, they're all uh, getting shorter and shorter lifetime. So this is crazy. Here we are, we have this powerful tool to help us manipulate, consume, generate, and share text, and yet we are doing a terrible job of preserving it. Unstable URLs. I mean, the domain name system has not done us a whole lot of good, partly because it was monetized. And once you monetize the URLs of the domain names, if you don't pay the rent, the domain name doesn't resolve, and whatever references there were aren't any good. I am terrified when I read academic papers now that have URLs in the references, realizing that those are going to be useless, potentially, even just a few years from now. Why are we doing this to ourselves? Uh, then I worry a bit about where we should focus our attention on preservation. And, oh good, I still have five minutes left, that's cool. Um, where should we be paying attention? And I keep thinking, you know, where do we put this digital stuff? Who can we rely on to save things for hundreds of years? And the answers, uh, only three answers that I've I come up with, maybe four. Libraries are one place where this problem has been dealt with over and over and over again. And so it's not a bad place. They have a persistence. They have support. Uh, I was also looking for other institutions that last for a long time. Breweries and wineries seem to last for a long time, hundreds of years. I haven't been able to figure out how to connect that to digital <laughs> stuff, but you know, I'm just looking in principle for what, la what institutions last for a long time. And then, of course, there's the Catholic Church. That's lasted for a couple of thousand years. And they even had a role to play in preserving information, as some of you will recall, monks in caves or little uh, cells, copying things, and as did uh, uh, our friends uh, in the Muslim world. Uh, during the Dark Ages. So I think libraries may turn out to be a key place for us to pay attention to. However, it's not just a matter of uh, physical preservation. We have to preserve our ability to actually read the content. And so the point about cuneiform is wonderful because if you don't know how to read cuneiform, then the fact that you preserve the images doesn't help. The same is true for software that helps you create, read, and interact with text. So we have a real problem here because the operating systems keep changing, the underlying hardware keeps changing, and we don't pay enough attention to backward compatibility. There is work going on to emulate uh, old hardware so that you can run old operating systems, so you can run old applications. The Olive Project at Carnegie Mellon is one, Rhizome is another one. There are several others. Freiburg University is very active in this space. But it's expensive and hard to maintain emulation of hardware. For one thing, you can't get the information. The uh, manufacturers may not want to tell you all the details about how this stuff works. And the funnier cases are the ones where there are bugs in the hardware that the software people take advantage of and then make some software that depends on the bugs. So if you have to emulate the hardware, you have to emulate the bug in order to make the software work. I mean, you know, woo! <laughs> so, so we have uh, a lot of problem associated with, uh, with maintaining software that can run for long periods of time. I'm talking about hundreds of years uh, into the future. So emulation may solve part of the problem. Some open software and open source may solve part of the problem. We can write new compilers to compile languages onto new hardware platforms. Uh, but there's more to this than just the technical side. In the last minute that I have, we have legal issues, intellectual property, who controls the software, who controls the hardware, who controls the content, and for how long and under what terms and conditions. And are there any business models that are actually going to allow us to preserve digital content for hundreds of years? That is the big question. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Questions? If there are any. Okay, now I'm going to mess this up because we'll try, uh, but I may not hear you. And if I can't hear you, I'm going to run over so I can lip read, and that messes up the recording. And that's too bad. All right, so go. I'm sorry, no, 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 the guy in the back. Then you're number two. Remember your number. Go. So is text linked to market function? I'm sorry, I did not hear that. I'm sorry for the display. So the preservation of text is linked to market function. Uh, 
iPhone, CD. Oh, okay. So the bigger thing is the technology is going to come along. Our response is hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The role of preservation, the role of preservation is going to be about whether there's any, in, uh, there's any profit in preserving. Uh, oh, okay. Fair enough. And that's a good point. Whether it's profit or sustainability in any case. Whether it's profit or not. I mean, so that is, they can cost something, profit. something somebody does pay for it. I think so. Yeah, very large source of your point. Just, just wanted to make a point about this. Google Drive, every document is a unique, comparable ID, which we last. As long as you're happy with that, that it's Google, whoever said what, that, that problem is not solved. So, so that, that we, and not only that, within a Google Doc, you can mark every sentence within an anchor. So every little bit is, is globally addressing. So, uh, so I, I think as long as things like that, Google, that kind of technology persists mm -hmm. in a library, and then, then this, this whole thing of the broken URL is, is solved. Uh, well, that, that may depend <coughs> on whether Google lasts forever. But it will. Yeah, they will if they, if they don't, then, then, then people can actually recreate. So if there's, you know, Bob Kahn has done some work on object IDs. Yeah, the digital object architecture. Yeah, that's, that, that's another example of yeah, finite that's what I'm fixed saying. thing. Yeah, so I agree with that. But we still have to have all the superstructure or infrastructure in order to support that. Holy crap. One, two, three, four. That's it. Go. That's it. Charlie Hartley. Um, so it's common on both of you can say, and also what Nigel was saying. Um, are we confusing here perhaps the idea of the longevity of a piece of media is necessary for longevity of a piece of information? Because there is the idea that obviously the pieces of writing and information that transcribes to new media as, uh, as things progress. So sure, yes, disks burn and you know, they disintegrate, okay, but um, it's often rewritten and history and mankind have got very, very good at preserving the things that matter to us. We will rewrite them to new media as, the, as things, things time goes forward. Sure, cuneiform on stone tablets is very, very enduring, but we only have a handful uh, of them, really. There was plenty of writing the Sumerians did that did, we did lose. And sure, we don't necessarily have the convenience to grab data off an iPhone that's six years old. But that's the difference between convenience and archaeology. An archaeologist really wanted to get the information in Nigel's six-year-old emails. Okay, they could take that data, they could probably translate it and find a way to read it if they really wanted to. Uh, uh, putting words in Nigel's mouth, we are both uh, a little suspicious of that. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me also uh, point out to you uh, that there are, if there are any librarians in this room, you'll recognize, <laughs> you'll recognize this statement. I had this conversation uh, once before, uh, and some young kid gets up and says, well, this isn't a big problem. The important stuff will get copied and, you know, and preserved, and the stuff that isn't important will go away and no one will notice. It took me half an hour to get the librarians off the ceiling <laughs> because they pointed out that you don't know what's important maybe for a year. In that particular document, that particular object, you're going, okay, we're going to run out of time. You're next. Yes. No. Who's next? You are. Go. So, predictable, I'm going to stick up for archives and libraries have it easy when it comes to digital preservation. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm just going to make the point that um, trusting the people who we trust to look after important physical things is not a, and putting them on the hook for looking after important digital things is not a bad strategy. Okay, good point. I like that. Who's next? There you go. Uh, yep, David Arto. Uh, um, people have talked in the past about the value of forgetting. Yeah. So perhaps the challenge no, here is... I'm getting older. I forget all the time. Seconds. <laughs> okay, I was just. Okay, just a really quick one. Yes. 
really quick. So we talked a lot about this not being a technical problem, it's a social problem. So essentially it seems to me that what we're trying to do is reinvent the social function of men or many institutes in the digital world. And there's what, one archivist, one librarian in this room. How do you best reinvent that memory function in the digital world and have that conversation and have that social infrastructure reinvent it? So I hope that we can take advantage of the librarian's <coughs> way of thinking in those next examples. Thank you very much, Vince. <laughs> Stacey Mason up next. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Stacey Mason. I'm here from the uh, University of California at Santa Cruz, um, where I'm in the Expressive Intelligence Studio there with the Center for Games and Playable Media. And then in my second life, I'm also a technical designer at Telltale Games, where I'm a creative lead for their R&D division. So I'm actually coming here kind of more from an entertainment media perspective and um, going to talk basically about how we do text authorship and why that's a bit inadequate, I think. So um, the title of my talk being The Future of Text is Procedural, which is either an interesting idea with some legs for discussion or kind of so obvious as to be banal, sort of depending on which uh, crowd you're coming from. So I think a lot of uh, how interesting that is sort of comes from what I mean when I say procedural, right? So um, by procedural, I'm specifically in this talk going to be talking about works created through combination of smaller bits, those smaller bits being uh, sort of selected through procedures, which is an intentionally vague answer. So that's the answer of a humanities scholar, um, which is to say it is vague enough to allow your own interpretation to some degree. And uh, much like a horoscope, you can sort of fill in some of the meaning there. Maybe we can have some discussion about that later. Um, but so within this talk, I'm going to be kind of speaking through uh, one particular framework. And that's one that's proposed by Michael Matias. Um, and so for him, generally speaking, interactive narrative is broken down into two things. So we're looking at units of content, some measure of text or, or other way of conveying meaning, and then uh, selection mechanisms, so ways to select that content. And so he's particularly talking about interactive narrative, but I think especially for this crowd, we can abstract that a little bit toward, you know, kind of how we're looking at text and how text is, you know, increasingly assembled procedurally. So I'm going to be speaking uh, from kind of a games perspective, but I think a lot of this is going to be a little bit more broadly applicable as well. Um, so what do we mean by content units and selection mechanisms? I'm going to kind of walk through a few uh, different means of presenting text and talk about what those might be. So if we look at, for example, a novel, I think you could make an argument for the content units there being, say, chapters or, or smaller bits of text. And then the selection mechanism here, when we're talking from an authoring perspective, really this is about as carefully curated as you get, right? The author has very explicitly decided that chapter one comes before chapter two um, and so forth. So that if we move from that to something like a choose your own adventure, um, which uh, this is a fantastic visualization done by um, a student and I'll put the link up later. but. Um, the uh, basically like we can think of the content units here as sort of the the different scenes or chapters or whatever this is um, a lot of what telltale games does is kind of the video game equivalent of this we have something like a scene it plays out your uh, audience then makes some kind of choice and then usually the way that we go from one scene to the next is this very hand authored kind of carefully curated process where somebody has decided if they make this choice we go to the next bit of text um, if we move from that to uh, sort of, you know, some of the more classic narrative hypertexts and some of the things we're seeing within hypertext games communities today, um, we take that and it gets a little bit more complicated. We can now apply logic and rules to the links people select. So we can say rather than just if you decide to do this thing, you'll go to this new content unit, this new bit of text, um, we can actually put uh, what we used to call guard fields, gates, we can um, apply some state to that. So we can say, you can click on this and you might go to this bit of content, but if you haven't, for example, gotten the key, then you'll see a different bit of content because you can't go through the door that you expect to be able to go through. Um, moving into a little bit more of a visual direction, uh, so Dragon's Lair was a popular game in the 80s, um, and so this was... Uh, an FMV game, they were pre-recorded bits of content 
that uh, similarly the player would sort of make a choice as you're going through. Um, and you w if you successfully completed each, uh, each objective within these little uh, scenes, then you would be given a next scene, but these were almost entirely randomly assembled. So you would see one scene, you would do it correctly, you'd go to the next random bit, right? Um, the effect of this was that the sort of overall narrative from one piece to the next ended up feeling a little bit disjointed. So if we move from something like this to uh, the Icebound Concordance was a procedural text game that's out just last year. It won a ton of awards for being kind of the future of what text-based games would be. And so basically there was a physical book object, which you can see there, um, and then an iPad uh, sort of app, which did AR overlays uh, that responded to what you were doing in the physical book. Um, and this basically, the text that the reader was seeing was assembled from uh, kind of states and different uh, uh, sort of feedback systems it was getting from the player, but even getting a little bit further away from that, what the player was actually doing within the game was taking uh, what they considered symbols, uh, so the, the premise being you're helping an AI author complete his masterwork, right? Um, so the player's actually selecting symbols within the thing, and then a really complicated AI system is actually constructing the narrative based on the symbols that the player is using. Um, so when I ask what we mean by procedural, really what I'm getting at is that we're looking at texts in which the selection mechanisms are sort of more handed over to rules, less hand-authored, um, and therefore more procedural. So um, I'm working on a procedural system at Telltale, and uh, this is kind of how we explain the process to our new writers. So rather than thinking of it as a hand-authored process where you're going from one bit of text, deciding what comes next, even in sort of interesting logical cases, what we're actually doing is constructing buckets of content and figuring out the rules that will allow the correct bit of content to fire uh, as we go forward. Um, and increasingly so, we're seeing this in the games industry, where we're really not authoring the content and how the player goes from one bit of content to the next, but instead trying to architect the system around it, wherein the system will appropriately choose what's coming next. Um, but this is not how we teach writing. This is not even how we teach writing in interactive narrative courses, right? Um, so at best in interactive narrative courses, we will get some discussion of how to hand author logic to achieve certain effects, um, but we don't necessarily talk about the aesthetics of, of that logic. What sort of things does the player experience when we apply these sets of rules? If we constrain the player in this particular way, you know, how, how does that affect their experience, right? So. Um, I would propose, you know, that we really need to be teaching logic design alongside writing. So we could be teaching, for example, that with this particular content selection paradigm, we get, you know, this particular effect. So with Dragon Lair, for example, uh, we get kind of these loose selection mechanisms, and this really affected the coherence of the overall narrative. Um, there are authoring patterns at work, and in the games industry, we actually recognize that there's, there's some common knowledge here, but it's not very well recorded, and we're not kind of giving it to students going forward. Um, so this is one that, that we recognize. Generally speaking, when there are smaller units of content, it allows you to have more variability within that content, but you lose coherence, or you have to apply a lot more sort of logic and rule structure in order to get that coherence back, so there's kind of a larger design overhead. Um, so going forward, um, I think that text is becoming increasingly procedural. Certainly, you know, most of the web pages we actually look at on a day-to-day -day basis are constructed very dynamically. Uh, text in general is becoming increasingly data-driven, both within entertainment media and outside of it, I would say. Um, and I really think that understanding the effects of rules and logic is kind of key to understanding the aesthetic effects of written work. So this is a thing that Noah Wardrop Fruin calls operational logics, which is sort of understanding how the logic of a particular system is actually conveying meaning and, and kind of uh, constructing an ideology. And so, um, you know, I believe that if we're not teaching writers how to wield the logic around the content, then we're really only giving them half of the toolbox and we're really only teaching them how to write content units without necessarily teaching them how to stitch them together.
Questions? Yeah, chat. Thanks, Stacey. Um, how do we teach writers operational logic? Because from experience, teaching them like you would an engineer doesn't work. So um, I would be really enthusiastic if you have any suggestions about how, how that happens. Yeah, so it's been really interesting. Um, so at Telltale, I'm working largely with Hollywood writers, actually, people that are not even necessarily coming from games writing background. So um, like the writer on my team right now was uh, an entourage writer. And so bringing these people into kind of what does procedural mean? And then, you know, additionally, how do we write these bits of content, right? Um, it's kind of an ongoing process. I think uh, when I'm teaching my students at Santa Cruz how to, how to write this way, um, we sort of start by going through um, analyzing different operational logics, uh, starting with kind of you know a novel and a choose your own adventure book where you can sort of see very easily these are the content units, this is the selection process, and then kind of making that more complicated as you go. So um, some other ways that we've done it is kind of looking at the way that we teach game design, which generally is let's figure out how to make the player do what we want through a set of rules. It's very similar. How do we make a machine do what we want, assemble the content that we want in a certain way um, within this algorithm we give it? Yes. You know, you hear the term form follows function. And interestingly, you just inverted that. And I <laughs> want to draw attention to what Doug Engelbart did with, it, with the uh, online system. Because the form in which you compose text in that system uh, induce a certain amount of content structure because you could show this thing, you know, only the first sentence of every paragraph or only the most important paragraphs and so on. That um, medium in which you were working and the rules mm -hmm. that Doug imposed on NLS actually forced you, if you were paying attention, to produce text in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so in a very interesting way, learning to use NLS forced you to learn how to write in a much more coherent way than you would otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting, powerful idea. And it's the first time I've ever thought about this being an inversion. Function follows form, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Yeah, it's a good point. Yes. Yeah, uh, larger content units create more coherence. Uh, I don't think this has ever been written. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is a thing I'm working on. A, a greater problem in teaching mm -hmm. is do we actually know these things mm -hmm. in the sense that you know them, I may disagree with that detail, but uh, how could people discover this except by bumping into the right works or the uh, right individuals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, um, particularly around games and interactive writing, we have a real problem of fractured community, where one community's common knowledge is completely groundbreaking and would change another community entirely. Um, so I think, you know, some of this within games is presented at GDC, it's written up on Gamma Sutra, but this is not a place that, you know, interactive literature scholars are looking for this kind of thing in terms of teaching their students. So. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I don't know that I have a good answer for that, other than it's it's disparate, and I think that's a problem. Yes. So, how do you include um, persuasive arguments in this sort of format? <coughs> We've had a lot of I've been having a lot of arguments about this for scholarly text. Mm -hmm. actually. And so, I'm just wondering, in this kind of format, how do you include persuasion? Um. So I think that, that sort of depends on which angle you're coming from. So I think Ian Bogos would argue that um, in you know, games, certainly, as this particular medium, the most persuasive way to do things is because games are a great medium for emulating systems and letting people interact with systems and play with them. Um, there's a lot of ideology embedded within systems, right? So figuring out kind of what the abstract core of the system you're trying to represent is and then using that in persuasive arguments. So you see these sorts of things with like news games, like uh, September 12th was a game where you basically just control a crosshair on a screen, it's a very simple game, and there are you know little Muslims that move around a screen, and you basically, you can click, a giant bomb comes in on your crosshair, blows up the building you're over and all the buildings around it, um, kills everybody in that radius, and then the people around that blast radius then are converted into terrorists, right? So that is a game that is presenting like a very strong opinion in some persuasive way. On that right? note, yeah. thank you. <laughs>
Sarah Walton. Check if yeah, you get the right one. Okay, hello. Um, I um, I'm going to talk a bit about a problem of lack of sourcing on the internet and uh, also lack of citation. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about something that intrigued me when I was doing some research, which is whatever happened to the Great Library of Alexandria. And uh, the director of the Library of Alexandria was going to be here today. So this is a homage to the, the Library of Alexandria. Um, and uh, Fred and I know each other. Um, we had a little start-up over in Silicon Valley a um, very long time ago. So I was uh, very honoured to meet um, Doug Engelbert and uh, very um, much support his way of thinking um, as this road. Um, but this is kind of taking a bit of a step back in time, this talk. Um, so, my homage to um, the Great Library um, started when I was doing some historical research. Now, the Great Library was the only library in history that had a mission to be comprehensive. Its aim was to house the, world, the whole world's knowledge. Until perhaps the internet, there's not been a library of knowledge which has been, not been selective in some way, shape or form. Now, the reason we can't be certain of its fate is partly due to historians not citing sources. So this is not an impression of the library. The only element of this an image is at, right at the top, that pillar, that's Pompey's pillar. Was this the Library of Alexandria? Probably not. Now, after its destruction in 391 AD, there are certain references to it, quite a few actually. Now this could be an issue of language. Bibliotheca in Greek also means shelves. So possibly there were shelves with books in all over the city of Alexandria. Private residences, the museum, quite likely also the Seraphim. This is an image from the 2009 film Agora. Exactly the same screenshot was also used in a BBC documentary which was talking about the destruction of the Library of Alexandria within the context within which it fell, which was the fall of paganism. So there we go, lack of sources, directly from history to myth. Now, it makes sense to zoom in on a key historical event to describe a change which took centuries, and it did take centuries, and some people would argue paganism never really fell. The Seraphium likely housed a very large proportion of books, and it was destroyed in 391 AD in the riots in Alexandria, but there were no eyewitness accounts. There were two contemporary accounts. One was pagan and one was Christian. This was war. There were blood on the streets. And we know which one won. Now, underlying the Christian um, account, Rufinus, there are probably, but we don't know for sure, two possible sources, both lost. There was Theophilus, who was a bishop of Alexandria behind the riots um, on the Christian side. Um, there was an account that he wrote for Theod uh, Theodosius, who was the emperor, about what happened in terms of the destruction. And then there was another account written by people of St. Jerome. But we can't validate this. There's several other accounts which highly likely use Rufinus as their original <coughs> source. But as they don't cite the sources, we cannot be certain. So, my only firm conclusion was that the contemporary accounts are so starkly in opposition, and they really are, um, that neither of them presented the actual effect, uh, events. And so what I did is what many ancient historians did when they didn't know what happened. And I made it up. And so what I ended up doing was I wrote a novel. <laughs> this is Rufius. Rufius meets Theophilus, who I did an inordinate amount of research on, but... Uh, He's very much a figment of my imagination. Now, the problem with that is that there's only one authority, and that's the author. Yikes. So, the consequences of not having citation or a lack of sourcing does not necessarily take us into the realm of fiction, but it makes confidence and credibility highly challenging. Now, to be fair, the evolution of citation likely started with the ancient orators, Cicero glossed his texts, and historians and early writers of scripture made notes in the margins. 
Now, the internet is ripe with opportunity to evolve and innovate into its next evolution. And it's not just academics who can benefit from a citation or sourcing culture. Many people assume that books will be boring if they've got citations in them. But making our citations accessible and making them fun for the public, I think, can enable people to be empowered to make their own decisions about their version of the truth. Um, I don't have shares in author. Um, Frode is my friend, but I would say that author is the first step or a step towards a tool which can make citations more attractive, more fun. Um, it includes um, video citations. You know, that's beginning to use the internet and the tools that we have available to us in a more fun and engaging fashion. Um, thank you for listening. If you're interested in Rufius, which I do have shares in, he's on Amazon. <laughs> and uh, there's also a link to author if you want to read more. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, but only after you promise to buy the book. <laughs> so actually, um, I thought that there were three libraries of Alexandria. Two of them burned down. The third one was built about 17 years ago. It's the current library of Alexandria. <laughs> $50 million project, magnificent place. The Internet Archive backup is there, in case anybody cares about that. But I did want to come back to the uh, question of one or two. My understanding is that there were two attempts to build that library. And one of them was burned, was burned down because Caesar used fire to destroy ships in the, in the harbor, and the fire leapt off the ship and burned down the library that was right there on the coast. Am I remembering that correctly? Um, partly, yes. So um, there were about hundreds of thousands of books destroyed when Caesar invaded the Alexandrian Great Library. Um, and on the shores of the Great Library were um, warehouses. So this is what some of these people have taken. They had shelves in them, which have been referring to. So you could refer to that as library. Might not be an edifice, but certainly they had shelves. And as we have, I mean, you know, British Library doesn't stock everything within. Um, it's, it's got. Uh, or is it now? King's Cross, I think. Um, all over the country, there's, there's, there's books, and, and because there's too many to put in one edifice. Now, in the first century, that there was uh, the, the docks, all of those books were burnt on the docks, but there were other buildings um, which housed the, which we have references to, which still existed and still housed a great proportion of um, books. Caesar then, we think, uh, gifted Cleopatra some more books, and they would have been housed somewhere. So that didn't, that first century incident didn't get rid of the Great Library. The second incident is the one I'm talking about in 391 AD. Right. Okay. That's the Christian destruction. So there's the yep. uh, Christians. Okay. And then the third one, they were then referenced still. The library is still referenced after that. Now I'd say that's probably the big one, the big destruction. What probably happened was that individuals and various scholars took the books and put them into their own residences or into other buildings that still existed. And then when the, the Arabs came, um, in the 6th century, they also talked about destroying the library. Um, and what they were probably talking about was a smaller group of books held in different places, in different parts of the city. But we don't know for sure, because there's no source of this. <laughs> um, I, when I talk to my students about sort of digital technologies, I, you know, I, I refer back to you know, sort of microfilm and you know, sort of the idea of putting lots of, you know, sort of Shrinking down lots of pages onto a you know, photographic negative, having lots of those on a roll, having ro rolls in, you know, in cupboards, have, you know, sort of on shelves, shelves in cupboards, cupboards in you know, sort of cabinets, in rooms, in buildings. And there's something there about the scale. And what you're saying about the bibliotheca sort of makes me think of the scale. Is there something about what was considered the right, you know, the scale, the possible scale of human knowledge, you know, at the time that meant you had that that ambiguity between a shelf and a building, and you know, sort of, and, and how it was related to individual scholars or a network of scholars. Mm, interesting. <laughs> it, it's possible. I mean, I think Greeks are very interesting language. Um, you know, the word logos, for example, the word can also be translated as spirit which would give us a very different interpretation of St. John's Gospel. And so I don't know about the word biblioteca, I've not looked into it enough, um, but I think that Greek held within it a sense of the spirit, the intuitive side of being, 
as well as logic, that I think we've lost in a lot of modern languages. But I don't know for sure in terms of that particular word. But yes, I think there's that element of scale, and beyond just physical scale as well with Greek. Uh, Alexandria was, con to the extent we know anything about it, it was consciously a preservation effort. Its successor in Baghdad, about which we know even less, uh, was even more consciously a preservation and data recovery effort. Uh, it seems that, in fact, at least in antiquity, efforts to preserve knowledge actually ended up concentrating it, making it easier to destroy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we're back to Watts, right? Watts is about to keep things safe. Yes, so the librarian. It's, it's, yes, it's interesting to appeal to libraries as that sort of totem of preservation, but libraries are always about access and preservation, so bringing knowledge together for that purpose, and actually the sort of collaborative space around that. What we see in the digital world is that that notion of access is radically distributed, right? You don't have to visit a certain location to get access. So how are we trying to bring preservation into that? Are we saying that we need to emulate these institutions of the past, or are we saying we need to bolt preservation into the infrastructure so that it's distributed in that same sort of way? That's interesting. Yeah, I think, just purely from my, my perspective, I think it's about respect for knowledge. And I think that, that now, even more importantly, and we're able to, that's able to sit with the individual as well. Um, so I think that it's not just down to institutions now. That's just my view, to, to preserve and respect knowledge. So uh, if I can just reflect on what is related also with what Mark Bernstein said, that's why we have helicopters in the military. Because once we had nuclear weapons, you could no longer do a beach landing because there was a concentration of forces that would be wiped out. So we had to distribute the forces and that's why Vietnam was a helicopter war. It was that issue of concentration has problems. It is not as robust as distributed as in many other systems. So I think Sarah is absolutely um, perfect to follow Vint and everybody was talking about preservation because if you don't have a way to point to something, it's not preserved, even if it is in one location, right? So citation and preservation has to go together somehow. But how is the issue? The how is the issue, yeah. <laughs> yes. You simply have the bolt on all the things that have got Alexandra um, brackets um, and it's thought of the way the big mountain might be. Let's try it. We've got something that's accessible and preserved at the same time. That'd be really rude and jump in on that one too. Well, obviously, the, the immediate thing is you know the amount of data, but there was a, an issue earlier about what should be preserved and what should not be preserved. The way that you said that, your tone of voice was very different from Mark's. So there is so much data that can be recorded, even what we recorded with this audio, with good quality. You know, should we only preserve a, a reduced version? Should there be an analysis attached to it? Should it only be the text? Should this be the video? Should the time, the space? There are so many dimensions of this that we need a really rich dialogue for how to mesh all these things together. The question, of author, the question of authorship is also very difficult. Because in the dialogue with you and me, who's the author here, for example? Anyway, sorry, please, you have another minute. <laughs> but I would say, I would come back to tools like author again, and I really don't have to say <laughs> But um, it, it's very difficult for an individual. So I stand by what I said. But at the same time, it's very difficult for an individual to, to categorize in the way that a librarian would. So you don't have standardization. But if there were a tool which was openly available and easy to use for everyone that did have that logic built into it, then I think it could become more easy to people to follow a standard of categorization um, if they decided to make their own preservation of, of knowledge. Thank you very much, Sarah. We, no <laughs> we now have a half, yeah, half an hour coffee break.